I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you so much for the invitation and for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work um, in front of this audience, uh, which uh, I think is quite uh, broad. So it goes from uh, probably there are some geneticists in the room and uh, people that are not even uh, scientists. So I will try to uh, please you all, um, hopefully. So, um, actually, I'm not a f marine biologist by training, I'm not a fish biologist uh, either, but I'm a geneticist, and I'm uh, very much interested in applying uh, genetics uh, to uh, a, var um, a wide uh, number of subjects, and lately I've been involved in applying uh, genetics to uh, fisheries management. So, uh, using this uh, triangle that was shown in the talk before, uh, fisheries management uh, consists on trying to find this equilibrium, right, between uh, being able, as humans, to consume fish uh, while also uh, sustaining the economy of the fisheries sector, ensuring that there will be uh, more fish in the years to come, and also ensuring that the environment is not too damaged by the uh, fisheries activities. So one of the main um, one of the main uh, things that need to be done uh, when we do fisheries uh, management is actually assessing the status of the fisheries. Uh, by assessing the status of the fisheries, uh, what is done is that several parameters are estimated uh, in uh, each fish stock, and I will come in a minute to what a fish stock is. Um, so that we can uh, assess what is the biomass of this uh, fishery and then we can make some uh, predictions on how this uh, biomass is going to be affected by uh, the different uh, fishing efforts that um, we, we may uh, do to it. Uh, but for a fisheries assessment to be effective, so in order to uh, assess this fishery correctly, we need to do it in a unit. Uh, so this is what we call the stocks, right? The management unit. So the efficient fisheries assessment requires that stocks are correctly defined. And how are the stocks correctly defined? By uh, having some uh, mm, biological meaning, let's say. So here is a cartoon example of uh, two stocks. So two management units we have used, uh, we have decided to use to assess uh, these hypothetical species, right? So we have the northern stock and the southern stock. This is not a random example. I'm putting this example because uh, this happens to several stocks. Uh, and the reason why we have this uh, separation in here, actually, it's uh, just because Spain and Portugal joined uh, the European Union a bit later than the other countries. And just uh, that's why we have, in many species, a southern stock that is actually separated here. But does this mean anything? Can the species cross this hypothetical line? And here is when we come to the definition of population, which would be the evolutionary significant unit. So in many cases, what happens is that we have stocks that actually include individuals from different populations. And we can have also populations that are actually assessed as independent stocks. This creates some problems uh, uh, when, when we estimate the different parameters. So if we compare this ideal situation well, where we will have the stock and the population match perfectly, we will be estimating parameters such as recruitment, growth, fishing mortality and natural mortality in actually a unit that makes sense. There are other cases where we do this estimation in a mixture of units. So we, we average out some parameters that shouldn't be averaged out. And uh, this can cause, in some cases, uh, for example, depletion of the uh, most vulnerable population. Or we can have uh, the other situation where uh, we have actually one single population that is managed separate uh, as two stocks. Obviously, we can have several different intermediate scenarios here, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, the conclusion from here is that it's very important that we really know the connectivity of the different populations so that we can define the stocks properly in a way that they match the actual natural populations. And this is what we do. Uh, so we uh, do, uh, I see that the font has changed. I hope this 
no other problems in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to be dividing this presentation into two. Um, one is tracking fish using SNP markers, so DNA, but SNP markers. I, I will come in a minute to what SNP is. And the other one will be uh, using uh, environmental DNA. So uh, in this case, what we would do is that we would start uh, not for water samples, but for tissue samples. So uh, in this case, we have this uh, mackerel here. Uh, we would collect uh, tissue samples, we would extract the DNA from these tissue samples, and we would do something that we call genotyping. So what is genotyping? Genotyping is basically to determine those variants that exist within a species, right? So uh, here as humans, uh, we don't have all identical DNA, so we have variants, right? Some of the variants, uh, some of those variants uh, mean something, and even morphologically, there are some variants for blonde or brown hair, or the color of the eyes, etc. Some variants, they're just neutral. They just are uh, variations that they don't uh, mean anything, but they are just var variants, right? So in the fish, it's the same. So we can determine those variants by doing this genotyping so that we can obtain tables like this one, uh, where for each of the variants, in this case SNP, so SNP stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, we can have the different uh, alleles, and then, so for each individual and for each variant, we have a different uh, allele combination. And uh, using these kind of tables, we can do all sorts of analysis, statistical analysis, uh, to check which individuals look more alike, how much diversity uh, is in one group with respect to the other, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to give you three examples where we have applied uh, SNP markers to actually track uh, fish. So the first one is the European hake. This is one of these examples, uh, as they were showing in the beginning, where we have two stocks, a northern and a southern stock, and the separation is just here in the southern part of the Bay of Biscay. This is in ISIS, so the International Commission for the Exploration of the Sea. Uh, so that's why I'm excluding uh, the Mediterranean and the most southern locations where the Hague is also found. So in, the, in ISIS, there are two stocks considered, the northern and the southern. And there are some s concerns uh, with respect to sto stock assessment, especially in the south. So some estimations seem not to be very accurate. And one of the hypotheses is that th this is could be because uh, the actual stocks don't correspond with natural populations. So we wanted to test if genetic structure support current stock delimitation. So um, here um, you can see the... Um, where we sampled the, the hakes that we were using in this study. So this study is led by my postdoc, Alice Manucci. And um, as you can see here, we have sampled about 400 individuals. Each dot in this map is one location from where we sampled the individuals, and they're just colored by the different locations that we chose. Um, and then we uh, discovered uh, 7,700 uh, SNPs using a technique that is called restriction site associated DNA sequencing. Don't worry too much about that, but just for those that know what it is, you know how the SNPs were discovered. Um, so we did well the first type of analysis we did was a principal component analysis. So in this analysis, basically each dot uh, is one individual, and how close they are in the in the graph indicates how similar they are genetically, and how far they are indicates how different they are genetically. These individuals are colored by where they have been sampled, but the location where they have been collected has not been used to do the graph, right? So this, this PCA was done blindly, and the colors were assigned after. So there is no prior information on the location. So I don't know if you have spotted this, what happens here, but I'm going to make it a little bit easier for you by turn it, turning it around. And as you can see, basically, the principal component analysis is the map of Europe. You can see here that we have the Norwegian Sea, North Sea, the Faroes, Mediterranean, Alboran Sea, and then all these here would correspond to this part here in the middle, right? So um, just by doing this principal component analysis, uh, we already observe uh, something that is very clear, and is that uh, the closer the Hagues are, the more similar they are genetically. This may seem trivial, but it's not so often that we see something like this, especially in fish, uh, so nice. We were really excited with this result. Um, also, what is interesting is that there is no clear break, so all the Hagues seem to be connected somehow. So we see that the Norwegian Sea and the Mediterranean Hagues are very different to each other, 
but they are somehow connected by using the different locations that are in between. We can do all sorts of analysis, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to show them all because we don't have time, but basically here we have a really nice case of a nice triangulation where we did many different analyses using different subsets of the data and so on, and they all pointed towards the same results. So it was quite nice to see. So we can check also the different uh, migration rates between locations. So as you can see here, the Mediterranean is the one that is farthest away from the others with also the Norwegian Sea in the Atlantic and the uh, Western Africa South, actually, here, that is a bit more different than the others. Again, we see that this uh, bulk of samples here falls also here in, in the middle, right? Another type of analysis we can do is that we can uh, calculate how, they how the geographical distance and the genetic distance correlates. So here we calculated the, genetic, the geographical distance uh, between the locations, avoided land, of course, uh, Haig haven't uh, learned to walk yet. Uh, so uh, avoiding land, we have calculated how far the different locations are. So you can see this here. And then uh, we have also calculated the genetic distance between location. So here, each point represents one pairwise comparison. And the colors, we didn't know how to make this graph uh, <laughs> clear, actually, but we decided to color the points by uh, ecoregion instead of having one color per location because it was too, way too, too many different colors. So as you can see, in most pairwise comparisons, there is a very good correlation between the geographical distance and the genetic distance. There are some locations that actually fall outside this trend, so they, they look uh, more different genetically, especially these ones, than uh, they should look uh, when we look at geographical distance. And those are actually all comparisons that involve the Mediterranean. So apart from just distance, there is some, some kind of environmental uh, distances here as well. And the same happens in this region here, where we see actually all these comparisons that involve this uh, region here are also a little bit more distant genetically than we would expect, uh, considering only the geographical distance. But in the rest of the cases, we see a very clear case of isolation by distance, right? So the more distance the haycock to the other, the more uh, genetically distant they are as well. And then we did another type of analysis as well, which is called an admixture. So here, basically, each of the thin vertical lines is one individual, and each of the thick uh, lines is a group, the group of individuals from the same locations, right? So here we will have several individuals that they all come from the Norwegian Sea. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, the colors represent the ancestry, uh, so in this type of analysis, you can make assumptions and you can assume that there is one genetic ancestry, two, three, four. Here, the most likely uh, scenario was that there were three genetic ancestries. Um, so you can see that we have the Norwegian Sea, that are very Norwegian, and the Mediterranean Sea samples that are very Mediterranean in yellow, and then you have in between. What is interesting is that just where the break of the two stocks is here is where the samples are more similar to each other. We are actually breaking this cluster here into two, but there is no differentiation between the samples that are located here. So instead, we could hypothesize that if a break should be uh, existent, it should be here and here, because it's where we see most of the differentiation. Um, we can also calculate uh, how much Mediterranean-like a location is, and this is what we did. So obviously the Mediterranean location is the most Mediterranean-like. And then as we move far from the Mediterranean, we lose this Mediterranean ancestry, being the Alboran Sea, which is actually here, as the transition between uh, the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. So those results are a little bit... Um, perhaps expected, but um, as I said before, it's not so common to find that in fish uh, w we see something so clear. Also, uh, hake is a quite residential species, so it's a demersal residential species, so it's interesting to see that there is actually connectivity 
Uh, even though we see differentiation between the locations, there is connectivity. So, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, we found isolation by distance with two stronger breaks, despite uh, them being still connected, and there is Mediterranean contribution to uh, Southern Europe location. So how should we manage the Hague now? We know that we cannot really manage it the way we do it right now, this is totally wrong, but what would be the best solution here? Just one stock, because they are all connected in a way, or three stocks maybe, because here we see that there is kind of a break, or perhaps we should try to do some spatial modeling where we actually include, we do like a single stock, but considering that there is more flux between some locations than between others. So we are discussing this uh, with uh, the assessment working group of Hague in ISIS, but we are also trying to figure out how we can provide more information about these movements. And actually, one of the tools we found that could be quite interesting for this is the closed kin mass recapture, uh, which can aid at inferring demographic connectivity. So this closed kin mass recapture is uh, a method that basically consists on finding kins, finding pairs of individuals that are related to each other. So either parent offspring pairs or half siblings, and well, we can even go to more <laughs> family uh, kins. Um, obviously, this requires analyzing tens of thousands of samples because the probability of finding two hakes that are actually related is low. We have calculated how many we would need, and we would need in the order of 40,000 or so. Uh, it's doable. Uh, <laughs> and we have also developed a SNP array that can allow us genotyping really quick and cheap this uh, big number of hakes we need. Okay, these are the acknowledgements of this section. <laughs> I have a lot of people to acknowledge and a lot of uh, institutions and bodies I uh, will decide to put them uh, just after each uh, case study um, anyway. Okay, next example I'm going to be talking to you about is the um, Atlantic mackerel. Uh, so the Atlantic mackerel, so this work uh, also is uh, led by Alice Manucci but was started actually by PhD student uh, Emanuela Guerra Sarabia. And this is a completely different species, so this is not a demersal, this is a pelagic, highly migratory species. It's widely distributed in the northern Atlantic Ocean, and what is interesting is that uh, it, this species spawns uh, in spring and summer, so usually it starts spawning in most southern locations uh, in spring, and then uh, a little bit later in northern locations, and then it goes north for feeding. So there are actually five recognized, uh, let's say, spawning components, so in the west, we have two spawning components, the south and the north, and uh, in the east, we have uh, three spawning components. So one in the North Sea, another one Bay of Biscay, Celtic Sea, and so on, and another one in the Cantabrian Sea. What is also and then, yeah, as I said, they migra migrate north for feeding. And then what is interesting about the mackerel is that in recent years, it has been found in most northern locations uh, that before it wasn't found. So it's a, an another case of a species that is actually migrating north. Uh, so there was uh, two main questions here. Are the different spawning components genetically different? So do they have this kind of homing behavior, meaning that whoever is born here, despite going up here to feed, do they come back to spawn to the same location or they don't care and they just spawn anywhere? And then another question is, uh, where this do these mackerel come from? Do they come from the eastern Atlantic or from the western Atlantic? So um, we did a lot of analysis again, so I'm just going to show you a few. So now that you know, this is the PCA and this is the admixture plot. So in the PCA, we see clearly western, eastern, Mediterranean differentiation, same as in the admixture plot. Something that comes out is that in the Mediterranean, we see genetic differentiation despite the two Mediterranean uh, locations being, well, the Mediterranean locations being quite close, so we have the Adriatic Sea that seems to be quite different from the rest of the Mediterranean. Um, and then we find that actually the samples from uh, Greenland here belong to the eastern uh, Atlantic mackerel. If we zoom in and we do some analysis only considering the west or only considering the east, we don't see any hint of genetic differentiation. We have tried using select adaptive markers. We have tried using only larvae, which are the ones that actually represent the place, uh, the spawning components. And we don't see any 
hint or whatsoever of uh, genetic differentiation. And we have tried, believe me, everything. We have squeezed the data in ways you are not supposed to squeeze the data, using a lot of uh, priors, and etc., and there is nothing. So it seems that it's completely a pan-mythic population. Um, we uh, have actually translated this for ISIS because it's quite important for them to understand if they should be considering the spawning component or not for the management. And we are also working with collaborators to expand this data set and to do further analysis. Because despite we squeeze the data, as I said, in many different ways, it is true that we are perhaps, uh, for example, lacking samples from the south of Portugal. So we don't know if the samples actually would behave the same as in the eastern side and so on. And also, we have sequenced the genome of the Atlantic mackerel so that we can have uh, the possibility of doing more analysis. I'm not going to uh, go to this in detail. If you are into genomes, here are the statistics. It's a quite good quality genome, uh, and it's available. I mean, it's, it's not available yet. Uh, we are uh, about to submit the paper, but if anyone is working on mackerel and wants to have the genome, I'm happy to give it right away. OK, here are the acknowledgments of the uh, mackerel uh, section. And now I'm going to be talking about the bluefin tuna, a little bit, because Brian is going to be talking a lot about the bluefin tuna. So uh, yeah. So uh, the Atlantic bluefin tuna, well, is a, you know, is a very, uh, is a commercially important species, uh, delicious uh, for sushi lovers and for uh, many different other uh, cooking uh, ways of cooking it. But it's super interesting from an ecological and conservation uh, perspective. So this species actually. Um, it spawns in uh, two sides of the Atlantic, so in the Mediterranean Sea and in the western, mainly in the Gulf of Mexico, but there are another potential uh, spawning location in the west. There are two stocks recognized, so the eastern stock and the western stock. So until recently, uh, the way ICAT, so International uh, Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, uh, they considered um, Whatever individual was caught in one side of this 45 west meridian uh, was either eastern or western stock, right? So the individuals were assigned to stocks depending on where they were captured. But we actually know that bluefin tuna can cross the Atlantic even several times in their lifetime. So the question is, do they come back to spawn to the place where they were born? Do they have a natal homing behavior as we were hypothesizing for the Atlantic mackerel? There are some evidences uh, that uh, suggest homing behavior, so tagging, so no individual tag uh, in one spawning location has been seen to visit the other spawning location. Spoiler, this has changed a little bit. This is an old paper, and actually there are examples, but uh, we have an explanation for that too. And then, uh, yeah, so no individual tag in the Gulf of Mexico has been found in the Mediterranean Sea. And also in using otolith microchemistry, which is actually another method to uh, track fish. So when we analyze the microchemistry of the otolith, which is this ear bone that the fish have, and we can actually analyze the, the microchemistry, and uh, actually it has been seen that the adults, when we check the, uh, the middle of the otolith of the adults, which represents when they were born, it actually matches uh, where they are spawning right now. So this is something that supports natal homing. And then, as I said before, there is also a new, not so new anymore, it's 2016, but we consider it new, uh, spawning ground that has been discovered in the Western Atlantic. So a lot of questions, right? Uh, does it have homing behavior? Where does this uh, new spawning uh, ground come from? Is it related to the Gulf of Mexico or not? So a lot of things that could be solved with genetics. Magic. OK, so we did this study where we actually sampled uh, what we call reference samples. That means larvae and yarn of the year. It is impossible that a tuna larvae can cross the Atlantic, and it is impossible that a yarn of the year, which are the size of my hand, more or less, can cross the Atlantic. So if they are captured, in the Gulf of Mexico is because they are born there. If they are ca captured in the Mediterranean, it's because they are born there. So we did this study with reference samples, and actually we find genetic evidence of natal homing. You can see here in the PCA differentiation and in the admixture plot differentiation. I will come back to the slope C a bit later. Um, what is interesting here is that the differentiation is not 
great, right? Remember in the Atlantic mackerel, we have the west and the east that were completely different. In the PCA, they were very far apart. Here, they are quite close. Actually, the FSTs, so the genetic differentiation, the measure we use for genetic differentiation of the bluefin tuna between the Gulf of Mexico, sorry, the Gulf of Mexico and the Mediterranean Sea, it's smaller than the one we find between the Adriatic and Tyrrhenian Sea for Atlantic mackerel. So this has probably to do with effective population size, but it's um, a bit too detailed, but it's quite impressive to see that there is not, not so much genetic differentiation. Despite we were able to uh, develop this genetic traceability tool that ICAT actually wanted to be able to assign individuals to their population of origin. So we apply this tool, it's a fluidine SNP genotyping array for the connoisseurs. <laughs> and uh, you can see here the um, assignment rates we got. So those are samples we knew where they were coming from. So we can assign 81% of the Gulf of Mexico correctly, 83% of the Mediterranean correctly. We have some uh, individuals that cannot be assigned, the ones in gray, and some that are assigned incorrectly. Still, we were able to use this tool to assign individuals from uh, the feeding aggregates in the bluefin tuna. So as you can see, most of the individuals captured in the eastern side of the, in the eastern stock were actually eastern origin. But strikingly, a lot of the individuals considered the western stock were actually eastern. It means that we are overestimating the western stock. And this is actually a problem. The western stock uh, is in a really bad condition compared to the eastern stock in the bluefin tuna. And one of the causes could be this, right, that we are overestimating it. So we are assigning the quotas thinking that the population is much bigger than it actually is. So as I said, there are some incorrectly in quotes, because they are not incorrectly, um, assigned individuals. So this tool, uh, we, we, we found that we were not happy with it in the sense that we have a lot of uh, individuals that couldn't be assigned to their place of origin. And we did a lot of things with the method, we tried to improve it, and we couldn't improve it um, no matter what we did. So we thought there was something biological, some th something biological perhaps, uh, that was avoiding us to, to do a perfect assignment. But still, this method uh, is now being used for uh, improving the management of Atlantic bluefin tuna in ICAT. And uh, despite this uh, proportion of individuals that cannot be assigned, uh, it's actually much, much better than what we did before. Because remember that before we were just thinking that all this were, was, was purple, right? So we are now doing much better job than we did before. But still, we wanted to keep digging. Uh, we continued to get funding, and we were excited about this species, so we thought it was worth expanding the data set. So we expanded the data set with many more individuals. Uh, we used spawning adults as uh, reference samples. So since homing behavior seemed to be confirmed, we thought maybe spawning adults can be used as reference samples. They are easier to get than larvae and young of the year. And also we included larvae from the slope sea, so about 50. 49 larvae from the slope sea. So for the first time, we were able to see what happened with the slope sea. So this is a lot of results, but I put them there just for the geneticists so that they can have a look at the graph. If you're not geneticist, I'm going to explain what it is, and it's going to be really easy. So uh, when we do a PCA, we see again Gulf of Mexico in purple, Mediterranean in orange, slope sea in uh, red. So we see genetic differentiation. The slope sea seem to be kind of in the middle, but what maybe you don't see, but there are some purple dots in the middle of the orange dots. This means that there are actually individuals captured in the Gulf of Mexico that have a Mediterranean genetic signal. So what is going on? We see that here as well. Is this is the same. It's two different analyses, but they show exactly the same. You see the distribution of the Gulf of Mexico individuals in purple, but you see here a little pop in following the Mediterranean distribution. And again, you see here in red, I don't know what I'm tweeting, but uh, here in red, you see that the slope C, they are kind of in the, in, the, in the middle, in between two other types of analysis, F3. I'm not going to go too much into detail, but basically this confirms that the slope C is in the middle, is admixed between the two. And again, if we do a demographic model, which is what is supposed to have happened, we also see 
that the Slope Sea receives a lot of migrants from the Gulf of Mexico and from the Mediterranean Sea. So different types of analysis with different types of uh, subsets of the data point towards the same, right? Two ancestral population, Slope Sea is intermediate, Mediterranean-like adults in the Gulf of Mexico. So, the conclusion from all this is that we have a genetically differentiated Gulf of Mexico, Slope C and Mediterranean Sea spawning components. They evolve from two ancestral populations and they interbreed in the Western Atlantic. So we think that this new spawning ground could be acting as a way where the two components are actually meeting, like a meeting point between the two. So how is genetic differentiation maintained despite gene flow? So we think that they are meeting. How come we can distinguish them? How come they are different? So there are two potential, maybe some more, but two hypotheses we wanted to test. One, adaptation. So despite that the fact that they mix, some are more adapted to one side or the other side of the Atlantic. So basically, even if you can make it, you're not going to survive or you're not going to be reproducing as much as in the other side. Or, oops, or there is a recent event. So eventually they will mix completely, but we just didn't have time, didn't let them time to do it, right? So, um, again, detailed um, results, but easy conclusions. When we analyze markers under selection, when we separate them from the data set, we remove them, basically, the neutral markers, they show exactly the same. So it seems that this is not driven by adaptation or selection. However, when we analyze the markers under selection, we see something weird, right? We see three groups that are not really related uh, with location. Um, the markers and the selection, we found that they are all located in the same region of the genome. And we found that actually uh, these markers are um, differently distributed. So one of the alleles, let's say, uh, is more present in the Mediterranean, well, is only present in the Mediterranean as homozygotes, and uh, it's uh, more abundant in the Mediterranean as heterozygotes. So, um, yeah, as I said before, so genetic differentiation cannot be explained with local adaptation, but these adaptive markers can help us understand further. And bear with me, I'm going to show you how. So when we look at only these markers that actually show this weird pattern, we can see that the individuals here, the ones that have this homozygous uh, um, genotype for these uh, markers, are closer to the um, albacore. Um, okay, so what is happening here is that uh, even though adaptive markers are not responsible, they support the view of migration rate from east to west uh, to being recently intensified. This may be a little bit uh, complicated to understand, but it has to do with the mitochondrial integration. So uh, we know that there has been a mitochondrial integration from the uh, albacore tuna to the Atlantic bluefin tuna. What we have seen here is that this integration is actually occurring also in the nucleus. So with the analysis we've done, what we have seen is that this integration actually occurred in the Mediterranean. So in the Mediterranean, there was like an encounter or several between the Atlantic bluefin tuna and the albacore tuna. We see signs of this encounter in the Mediterranean Sea individuals very little in the slope sea individuals and almost nothing in the Gulf of Mexico individuals. So this means that this, this albacore signal is spreading. Uh, if there was a complete mix, we would see this, this albacore signal all over. But the fact that we see it like gradually from Mediterranean to the Gulf of Mexico shows that uh, this is something that has happened recently. So basically, the interspecific inter integration reveals gene flow from the Mediterranean Sea to the Slope Sea. So recent event, yes, potentially we are uh, in, a, in a recent event situation. So what do we think that had happened? So if we take the Pacific bluefin tuna, well, albacore, let's say uh, uh, Atlantic bluefin tuna stays here. So we think that there was a split between the east and west, another further split in the west. We have a mix between the Pacific and the Slope Sea. We had the integration from the albacore, and then the, this integration is spread uh, into the West. So that's the hypothesis we think. And all this is uh, in ICAT, and they are actually uh, aware of this. 
And five minutes? No? Yeah, you have five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So in five minutes, I'm going to talk to you about eDNA now. Um, so another thing that is interesting for fisheries management is also uh, knowing where the fish are, and especially the ones that we cannot really fish that are elusive or also invasive species. And uh, there are many other things uh, that we want to know for fisheries management apart from the population connectivity and the stock uh, delimitation. And uh, this is what it is about tracking fisheries in environmental DNA. So basically, environmental DNA would be the DNA that we find in the environment. In the case of fish, uh, usually what we call environmental DNA is the DNA we can extract from uh, the traces that the fish releases, such as scales, for example, in this case. So those scales have DNA that we can collect when we collect a bucket of water. And by analyzing this bucket of water, we can obtain either which species are present or either if one species in particular we are interested in is present or not in an assay that is very similar to the ones we have been using quite a lot through these years for COVID testing, right? So it's the same. So we have been applying this to rivers, to epipelagic ocean and deep ocean. In rivers, in the context of diadromous species monitoring, so how far can they go? Can, can they cross existing barriers? What are their seasonal movements and so on? So instead of electrofishing or traps or telemetry, actually, uh, we could be using eDNA, which is just collecting a bucket of water. So we've been analyzing uh, a network of rivers in Europe. So I'm going to show you just a little bit of uh, for shad in the rivers in the Basque area. So basically, uh, this is orange is what we expect. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, this is what we expect. So orange is, we don't know, red is not expected because there is a barrier, and red expected because we found it using other methods. Basically, eDNA confirms uh, the negatives, confirms the positives, and gives some negatives or positives in the unknowns. There is, interestingly, this is another area that we can find actually temporal changes. So here, for example, in the 5th of May, in this location, we didn't find we, there was a negative, but in the 20th of May, it was a positive. So talking with the experts, they tell us it makes sense because maybe the shad didn't come back still, uh, so they came be between these dates, right? Uh, what is interesting also, this is <laughs> very preliminary, uh, and I need to work a little bit more on this, but we actually found that the DNA copies per liter of water decreases as we move upstream, which is, well, quite interesting. I mean. It's not very statistically <laughs> worked, but uh, it's quite interesting. I'm going to pass this because I'm going to show you about this, the dark ocean. So one of the interesting applications we found of the DNA is exploring the, the dark ocean, so the deep ocean, difficult to access, right? Um, it is very trendy now because it's, well, it's um, uh, thought about a new opportunity, source of food for human consumption, aquaculture, and so on, but it has a key role in trophic connectivity and carbon sequestration. So if we um, take action in the deep ocean, uh, we are going to disturb uh, the environment and we don't know the consequences, so it's important to understand it. What is important as well is that we have a set of organisms that do these dial vertical migrations in the deep ocean, so they go uh, up for feeding in the night and they go down to avoid predation uh, during the night. So we applied eDNA analysis to vertical profiles, so we collected samples from zero to above uh, 200, 2,000 meters during the day and during the night. So overall, here, overall we find that the deep sea species, so the ones in purple are the deep sea species, the deep sea species, they increase as we move down, so more deep sea species in deeper waters. But what is most interesting about this work is that during the day, the uh, deep, spe deep sea species are in the bottom, but during the night, we see an increase in the surface. So it's quite interesting that using eDNA, a bucket of water, we can actually detect these vertical dial migrations um, in, the, in the fish. And we can also do that individually. So at, here we picked three species. So you can see here during the night, more abundant. Uh, the Emerolicus molleri is more abundant during the night in the surface, and the same thing for Bentosima. We have some sedimentation as well, so the DNA sinks. Uh, this is what explains this in the bottom. And we have other species that they don't do the dial vertical migrations, they are just deep sea species, and we only found them in the deep sea. 
Uh, it was a bit fast for the eDNA, but anyway, you will get more about the eDNA in the next talk. Uh, this is the acknowledgement for eDNA, and I'm going to finish with this uh, inspiration picture. I just came back from this workshop uh, in Monterey, in the uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and actually there is a lot of a whole work, a uh, whole world of eDNA research uh, that is going on with automated samplers in situ analysis that will allow us to explore the ocean in ways we can not even imagine now uh, how. So, and with a quote from Ryan Kelly that says, the ocean is a soup of its resident species genetic material. So we just need to go and uh, sample it and analyze it and we will know everything. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Completely amazing, fascinating stuff. Uh, almost too good. I mean, you will be able to completely make telemetry. <laughs> <laughs> too good to be true, you mean? <laughs> something that is completely <laughs> unnecessary in the future, which would oh. be horrible. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I must say, I promised myself not to st start talking about bluefin tuna, because when I do that, I can't stop. You have to drag me out and put me on tranquilizers. But I can't help myself. So I must ask a question before I let the audience in here. So when you do that, I mean, the, the thing, I, your paper on slope C is, is great. And, and the, the way you sort of understand that do you think? Do you still think it's it's functional units, the eastern and western? Uh, and if you do so, should you sort of try to adjust the 45th longitude at some point? So I think that for now, uh, using this tool that can assign individuals to each stock, so to which to where they were born, let's say, uh, for now it's okay uh, because that's much better than what we did before, which was just throw a line and whatever is here is this stock and whatever is here is this stock. But I think that the it's so dynamic what's going on that we should keep monitoring. And I didn't mention, but we also developed the SNP array for the bluefin tuna. So the idea is to keep monitoring and close skin marine capture as well. So the idea is to use this tool until we come with a better way of doing the the assessment. But for the moment, it's difficult. I mean, the the best solution would be to have a single stock, but uh, understanding all the movements, because it's not a fully panmetic stock yet. Uh, and we think the slope C is playing a big role in the connectivity of the two. Probably if the, the slope C didn't happen, perhaps they would be still fully separated, I don't know. Yeah, and, and I also think Bluefin Juno really represent a, a really good uh, example of where all these tracking technology together make the whole picture, right? The genetics, the autolift chemistry, the telemetry. Exactly. Sort of Look, for us, yeah, today it was too short, but, um, well, it was too long talk, too. But, but w we did a lot of uh, work on combining genetics and autolith microchemistry, and actually this is what helped us formulating a lot of the hypotheses we have been then testing using genetics, thanks to the autoliths. So if it and also the tagging, I mean, yeah, we are uh, using all the information that we can. Yeah. Amazing. So I almost used up all your time. Sorry for that. <laughs> are there any other questions here? Yeah, it's not when yeah, there. Yeah. Great. We have a few minutes, I think. Hello, Linnea, Swedish Anglers Association. Uh, let's talk money. Uh, eDNA uh, expensive, telemetry is expensive, everything is expensive. Do you think the future is going to be less expensive? Um, okay, another question. How expensive is to not monitor the marine environment? What is the cost of not monitoring the marine environment? First question. And the second, expensive to the respect to what? Imagine a set of uh, fisheries surveys that occur in Europe every year, even every quarter, several times a year. Fisheries surveys, boat time, personnel, and all that. Imagine autonomous vehicles just going through the coast with no people, with nobody, no analysis to be done on, on the boat, no fish, to, to that you, you don't have to capture any fish. So I would say DNA is cheap, very cheap, compared to the rest. We just have to make it work. We just have to make it functional. I completely agree. <laughs> of course, I do since I'm a biologist, but si I anyway have to fix my money uh, to do all these analyses. So, um, okay, you don't see the future being less expensive. 
Uh, I see in the future uh, surveying the marine environment being less expensive because we will be using eDNA instead of other more expensive techniques, as we do now. <laughs> I mean, if you use eDNA plus, I mean, if you see, um, if you, you think, okay, we are monitoring the environment now, using a lot of money, uh, and on top of that, we add eDNA analysis, of course it's going to be more expensive, right? Perhaps it's going to be cheaper in the long term because we will be doing a better job. But the idea is that eDNA can replace many of the monitoring activities we do now. And probably it can replace uh, in a much more cost-effective way. Yeah. Sorry, no more questions. I just I took the first question. so We don't have time. We need to change speaker. But thanks again. That was an amazing talk. Thank you.